mixed quartet coming to sing tonight, and they're going to sing a Gaither song entitled Something Worth Living For. Take your Bibles uh, tonight and uh, turn to Matthew 24 and then Psalm 46. We often start in Matthew 24 uh, as we've been talking about some of the events around the world. And I want to try to transition away from uh, these messages uh, over the next uh, few weeks. I, I'm, I'm getting a kind of a reputation of, you know, the gloom and despair, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, messenger up here, and uh, <clears throat> I could sing that song, I guess, a like gloom and despair and misery. No, I don't think I'll go there. But uh, there's a lot of things that are happening around the world that can be discouraging. It could be depressing. 
There's a lot of things that happen in our, in our lives that could be discouraging and depressing. You know, and, and uh, as, as we grow older, notice I said we. You know, I used to, I remember when I first uh, started going to church, not long after I was saved, I was in my young 20s. We were in a young couples class. We had couples in the young couples class that were actually in their 30s. The nerve of those people to call themselves young couples. And I said, you know, they, they don't need to be in the, with us, young couples. And then when I got 30s, I thought a little bit different. And 40s. And I thought, you know, these 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, that's, uh, that's not looking so old anymore to me. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about it is, well, you know, I can't do the things I used to do. I, you know, I sat there and waited for phone for 40 years for an NFL team to call me. I think they lost my number. Uh, I don't think the call's coming. You know, we can get discouraged as we grow older and, and, and we lose some of the abilities that we had as, uh, as uh, even it's told it, physically, it takes its toll on us. Uh, we could, we could kind of get discouraged and depressed about that, but we're one day closer to Jesus Christ coming back again. You know, every day that we think about that, you know, that's all part of it, the, this, this aging process. I, I really, as, as pastors mentioned many times, I look for the Lord's coming at any time. And I really believe I'll be here. But if not, that's fine too. I'll be glad to, to take the trip up in the air with the rapture and, and, uh, or to where he comes and, and raises me from the, from the grave because those are the ones that are going to be rising first. And so either way. But we get discouraged about things that happen to us. Maybe we're going through financial crisis in our life. You know, maybe there's, there's diff- difficulties with family, relationship problems. There's a lot of things that we can be discouraged about. And, and then the things around the world, and then coming over to the United States, even in, in, in our country, some of the things that we're reading about with the, the murders and, and the crime rate and the diseases and so forth, there's a lot that we just think, you know, what is there worth living for? Yeah, well, that could make a good song. You know, Jim, there's something, he gave me something worth living for. I think we'll write that song down. That would be a good one. I haven't heard that one in five minutes, probably. <laughs> good song for tonight. But... Uh, so anyway, as we talk tonight, I want to mention some of the things from Matthew 24 <clears throat> that are things that are happening around the world that have to come to pass. If they don't come to pass, then Jesus is not coming back because He said these things have to come to pass. The end's not yet, but these things will come to pass before I come back again. And so that's where we're going to be looking tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. and We'll get started in Matthew 24. Father, Lord, we do thank You for Your love for us, for Your promises to us for your help to us in time of need. And Lord, uh, knowing that you're in control no matter what happens in our lives personally, uh, in our world, Father Lord, we know that you're still in control. And so Lord, just help us to keep our eyes focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I want to talk tonight about be still and know that I am God. And we'll get to that in Psalm 46. But we're going to start off in Matthew 24, but be still. And we're going to talk about those words, be still, exactly what they mean. But in Matthew chapter 24, I want to begin reading at verse number 3. We've read these verses over the last few weeks. It's really when Jesus is leaving with the disciples from uh, visiting there at the temple. And as they're they're leaving, and he had just talked about the destruction of of those uh, walls being torn down and, and, and the and the disciples thinking, well, this is going to be the last days. When are these, what are going to be some of the signs that we see this happening? And Jesus says in verse number 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when these things shall be, and what shall be the sign of, of thy coming, and at, of the end of this world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And I started thinking about this. You know, today we hear about the news around the world instantaneously. I mean, with the, the technology that we have today, we know what's going on around the world in, in, in just an instant. It, it wasn't that way in, in, uh, in the times of Jesus and the disciples. It took months, maybe even years, for news to travel uh, to distant parts. And yet, he said, you're going to hear of these wars and these rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. See, Jesus is warning us that one of the signs that we look for 
for his coming is for nations to be rising against nation. And, and we see that happening. He warned us that this is going to happen. I was looking on the, uh, on the internet at, at some facts here, and, and there's a website called globalsecurity.com. It talks about all the wars and all the conflicts around the world. And I'm talking about major wars now. You know, we think, well, I know there's at least three, four, five. Would you believe 29? There's 29 wars going on today around the world. You're going to hear of wars. You're going to hear of rumors of wars. Uh, ISIS, as we know, that's what we've been hearing about mostly uh, in, in the news. They've become our newest enemy. and We've watched in, in horror at the, at the things that they do, the, the beheadings. They, they post them on video. The wickedness of, of that religion. And yet, uh, there's a war going on, even within the... the oh. And so there's wars that are going on there. And, and, the, and, and recently, even in our own country, we talked about this last week, the, the beheading in Oklahoma. You want me to quit here? All right, let's pray and we'll be done. Here? All right, I guess my battery's going dead. And this is going dead too. All right, so we're going to turn this off. All right, we're good. All right. So we've read about it here recently in Oklahoma, and ISIS we know is using social media to get their message out. We talked about this, this ISIS manifesto they put out, where they're encouraging Muslims worldwide to look up families of people serving in the military and to go to the homes of these military and slaughter their families. This is a wicked religion. And this is, a, we are at war, call it what you might, but we are at, we're at a, a war, not only in weapons, but a spiritual war. And uh, this is all stuff Jesus warned us about. And uh, they have the technology now, we think that they don't uh, have all the modern things, but using the social media, they can actually even disrupt our communications, hack our, commu our computers. But Jesus warned us of these things. He says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, and certainly we hear that Today, nation shall rise against nation. He goes on in verse 7, says, there shall be famines. And as of last week, uh, actually as of last month in September, according to the New York Times, 33% of the United States was experiencing some degree of drought. We're going through drought right now, especially out west. In California, they've taken some drastic measures to reduce the water consumption there. And the farmers there, because they don't have access to all the water that they need from the reservoirs, now they have to decide which crops they're going to water and which ones they're going to let die out. And then other parts uh, of, the, of the country, Texas, Oklahoma, some of those surrounding states, they're also suffering from drought conditions. But the U.S. is not alone in this. It, it's, it's worldwide. And this, this drought is actually threatening the, the future of water and, and food supplies, and as a result, it's going to affect the global economy. All these things are happening, especially in Colombia and Pakistan, Somalia, Australia, Guatemala, China, Kenya. These, are, these countries are having severe drought conditions. <clears throat> but Jesus said that there's going to be famines. He warned us of that. He said there's going to be pestilence. And the most talked about news this week is Ebola. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, and we're seeing it come home now to roost. Uh, this Ebola virus is now coming to our country. One infected individual who came from Liberia now has, uh, in the hospital, I heard today, he's in critical condition. He's taking a turn for the worse. But there's four members of, of the family, I guess, that he was staying with now. They're quarantined. They actually have armed guards there that don't let them go outside. And there's about 100 others that they're monitoring that he's come into contact, contact with. And then there's also this uh, enterovirus, uh, D68. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, you know what I'm talking about, this respiratory virus that's out there. According to the CDC in Atlanta, there's been 500 cases uh, since August in the United States and, four, and four, spread out through 42 different states. But that's probably a low estimate because most of this goes unre unreported. 
But this shouldn't surprise us because Jesus said that there's going to be pestilences. There's been as many as uh, four that have died from this. I believe they said ten children have been paralyzed because of this, this virus. But Jesus said there's going to be pestilences. He said there's going to be earthquakes in, in diverse places. Jesus warned us about earthquakes. You know, if you think there's more earthquakes than usual this year, you're right. A new study finds that there's more than twice as many major earthquakes in the first quarter of 2014 as compared with the averages going back as far as 1979. The average rate of big earthquakes, listen to this, those, and by that we talk about those that have a, on the Richter scale, 7.0 or above. <clears throat> in 1979, it was 10 per year. And then that rate rose to 12 and a half per year starting in 1992. And then in 2010, it jumped to 16.7 per year, a 65% increase compared to the rate since 1979. And this increase has accelerated in the first three months of 2014 to more than double what the average was. The number of volcanoes that are erupting continues to rise. Scienti scientists can't explain why, why this is happening. Uh, we've witnessed in, in 2013, we witnessed the most volcanic eruptions worldwide than we've ever seen in a single year and this increased activity is carrying over to 2014. Shouldn't surprise us, Jesus warned us there's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. Then he goes on in Matthew 24 and verse 8, he says, And these are the beginning of sorrows. <clears throat> they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And going back to ISIS, they're systematically beheading children, mothers, fathers. In Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, 95% of the Christians were forced to flee while the other 5% of the Christian population converted to Islam. And the Christians who thought they could es escape the persecution by paying a fine they later discovered that after they paid the fine, the ISIS militants took their wives, took their daughters, and made them their own wives, their own slaves. And then they've gone to all the homes of, of the Christians that have fled Mosul, and they put a, a red stamp of death on those homes, basically saying, we know who you are, and if you, if you come back, you will be killed. The number of Christians killed worldwide Christians because of their faith nearly doubled from 2012 to 2013. It's increasing. Jesus said, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Most of those killings happened in, in Syria, followed by Nigeria and Pakistan. In 2013, North Korea was still rated as the most dangerous country for Christians to live in, followed by Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. But this doesn't surprise us, because Jesus said, these things have to happen. And we can, be, we can look at it two ways. We can be discouraged because of all this. We can become depressed, or we can say, it's almost here. <laughs> it's getting closer. It's getting closer. Verse number 10, Matthew 24 still. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise. Many false prophets shall rise and, and deceive many. Jesus warns about these false prophets, these, these, relig these false religions, these, these cults. Do you know that in America today, there are 2,500 cults? <laughs> I never would have thought it was that many. You know, you hear of the ones back, uh, some of you all remember the Branch Davidians with David Koresh, some of those things back further than that with uh, Jim Jones and the, and the People's Temple. But, but they're everywhere, not just these wicked religions like Islam that are based upon a false prophet, but even in our own country we see this. And these cults are characterized by an anti-biblical elevation of their leaders. 
Many of the, the cult leaders claim themselves to be deity. Another common trait of, this, of, of cultism is the mind control that they have upon their followers. Cults do not uh, promote a study of, of their members of, of the scripture. When scriptures are used, their interpretation must be supplied by the leader of the cult. And cults usually include a latter-day revelation that goes beyond what God's word has revealed. And there's, just in the top three cults in America, there's over 31 million followers, not to say anything about the 1.6 billion Muslims worldwide. But it should surprise us, because Jesus said, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. It's, it's happening. It's coming. In verse number 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus warns us in that verse that sin is going to be rampant. Love is going to wax cold. It's going to become cold. There's not a day that goes by where you don't hear on the news about the crime, the horrible crimes that are taking place in, in our cities, in our countries, in our counties. A college student in Virginia goes to a party and disappears. A real estate agent in Arkansas goes to show a house. Her body turns up a few days later. I mean, even you read of parents killing their children. What's happening? Love is wax cold. Sin is rampant. Even in Tallahassee, a grandmother murdered her grandson recently. It, should it surprise us? Jesus said, this is what's going to have to happen before he comes. Turn to Psalm 46. Let's go ahead and turn there. Psalm 46. So I hope you're not frightened because it's not hopeless. Let's see how God views all this disturbing news here is in Psalm 46. Psalm 46, look at verse number 8. The psalmist writes, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He hath made the Lord? has made these desolations? Well, the Lord never creates evil or wickedness, but sometimes he allows these things to take place. And, and, and why would God allow these things to take place? Why would he, the, the psalmist word this as, as his works, these des, desolations? Well, because these things are a sign, they are a, a prerequisite to the Lord Jesus Christ coming again. Now, all these horrible events are, are a promise from God that these things, you may not like them, they're not going to be pleasant, but they are going to take place before I come back again. Just as sure as my promise is that I'm coming back, these things will happen. These horrible events. Psalm 46 is, is very prophetic for what we're experiencing in current events today. Look at verses 2 and 3. We're just going to stay in Psalm 46, verses 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not, uh, therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, and though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, we will not fear. Because we know the Lord is in control. Though there's going to be earthquakes, <clears throat> we won't fear. <laughs> we know God is in control. There will be volcanoes. There will be tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes. We will not fear, as the psalmist says here. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> verse 6 says, And the heathen raged, and kingdoms were moved, talking about wars here. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Though there be wars around the world, we will not fear. We won't be dismayed. We won't be distracted. 
However, in the midst of all this chaos, there's a promise. Both verse 7 and 11 are identical. Look what it says here in verse 7 and 11. I'm just going to read it once. The Lord of hosts is with us. Amen. And the God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Now, according to Revelation, you don't have to turn there, but it's in Revelation 19. When it talks about the Lord of hosts, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. No matter what happens, whatever this world can throw at us, the Lord Jesus Christ is our refuge. He's with us. Revelation 19 says this, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We have the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. We have God as our refuge, as, as our mighty fortress of protection. What have we to fear? We have nothing to fear. God is with us. Look at verses 4 and 5, Psalm 46. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The city of God. Hey, the holy place. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about heaven. The tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. These verses describe the ultimate destination. See, we're just a pilgrim passing through here. Don't get too comfortable. In light of eternity, man, life is but a vapor. It appeareth for a while and then it vanisheth. And we're on our way. Jesus has prepared a place. He's promised to one day come uh, for us. But first, uh, all these things we've talked about today, all this, this wickedness and disaster and destruction, this has to take place. Our, our greatest fear sometimes as a Christian, or, or even for anyone, is death. But as a Christian, we don't really have to fear death because we're dead already. In Christ, in fact, our focus shouldn't be on the terrible things occurring around the world. Rather, our focus should be on the promises that Christ has given to us. Listen to Colossians. You don't have to turn there, but it's in Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 2 through 4. <clears throat> Paul writing here says, Set your affections on things above, not on things of earth. Don't get comfortable with the things down here. Set your affection on things above. And then look at the next verse. He says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. We are dead to this life. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The dead are not affected by all the atrocities that we see going on, the disasters that we've mentioned, and neither should we be. Our life is not only hidden in Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ is our life. And and. When we, in the midst of all this chaos, when we reveal Jesus to the world, he'll be exalted. That's what we're here for, is to exalt Christ to the world through our words and our actions and that we share in his glory. And now let me wrap it up here. So how are we to handle these tragedies? And 
and the worries that go on around us. But look at verse 10. And this is the title of the message. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted upon the earth. You ever think about those words, be still? You know, I, I always thought it meant to be quiet. <laughs> uh, you know, to, uh, to meditate in prayer. Now, that's not really what it means. The word be still is the Hebrew word rafa. And it's used 46 times in the Old Testament, but only one time is it interpreted be still. And that's here in this verse. And, and what it actually means, it doesn't mean to be quiet it means to relax, to, to let drop, to, to hang limp, to sink down, to, to be feeble. Well, what's he saying here? Well, you, you ever gone to the doctor and, they, and you have a shoulder injury or whatever, and they tell you just to relax that arm and they hold it up and they let go of it and you're still holding it? No, I said, relax that arm. I am relaxing it. Why is it still up there? You know, when you, you're supposed to just let it drop, just hang limp, just let go. That's what Jesus is telling us to do. Be still. Let the Holy Spirit just, let, just relax and let the Holy Spirit have control of our lives. And he'll exalt the name of Christ through us. In, in the midst of our troubles, we're to let go. We're to purposely to become weak. What happens if we, if we go limp? Well, we're going to fall to the floor unless someone's there to catch us and, and to prop us up. And God says, go ahead. Go limp. Be still and know that I am God. And we have to trust him to prop us up so that he'll be exalted. All the world will know of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happens if we sink down? We become overwhelmed? Well, God says, go ahead, sink down. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. God understands that there's times when we're, we're overwhelmed and and uh, we're over our heads in things. But, but he's going to lift us up so people throughout the world will honor him. What happens when we become feeble? When we can't walk very well? We can't take care of ourselves? God says, go ahead. Become feeble. Be still and know that I am God. He wants us to be feeble so that we have to rely upon his strength. And when we rely upon his strength, all the world will honor him. He will be exalted. Verse, Psalm 46 begins with verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. God promises to be our source of help. In any trouble, any trial, that we face. Now, he doesn't say that he's going to be our solution, but he promises to be our help. He doesn't say that he's going to prevent trials from our life, but he's there to help us each step of the way. Whatever we go through, he's there to help us. There's a lot of things occurring in the world today that could cause alarm, fear in our hearts, but as a Christian, we're on the verge of a great reunion. I mean, the, the greatest homecoming in the history of the world is not far away. We don't have too much more time. We have to wait. But until, thing, until then, things are going to be happening. They're going to continue to happen around the world. And we have to rely upon God because there's no one else that, that can help us. There's, there's nothing else that can help us other than God. And this day is fast approaching when we're going to see the fulfillment of verse 9. Psalm 46, 9 says, He maketh the wars to cease until the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. It's all going to end one day. One day there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more tears. All those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior have that assurance. But also, though all wars are going to cease, there's going to be no more famines, diseases, earthquakes, the enemies of Christ will one day bow their knee and confess that he is Lord. The deceivers of man are going to one day have to stand face to face with he that is truth. 
there's a day of judgment coming for the unbelievers. So when you hear of all the evil and the injustice in this world today, don't despair. Don't get depressed. Don't get discouraged. Be still and know that I am God. And I'll be exalted among the heathen and I'll be exalted in the earth. Let's go ahead and pray as our, we prepare for our invitation. Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the word of God, and we thank you for the hope that we have in, in your word. Father, Lord, we know that there are things that happen to us daily in our lives on a personal basis and in the world around us that could be discouraging, that could be depressing, that could cause fear, could cause alarm in our lives. But, Father, Lord, you've promised that you're our help in times of trouble. Father, Lord, you promise that you'll lift us up, you'll prop us up, Father, Lord, just to be still and allow you to do so. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen us and encourage us and that you would use us, our lives, Lord, to exalt the name of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and say.